In 1429, France was about to fall. Then, a peasant girl who claimed she was having visions from God rallied what was left of the French resistance and won a series of startling victories that saved the nation. With a will of iron and absolute conviction, this illiterate teenager appeared suddenly on the world stage. She turned the tide of war, fulfilled the purposes she believed heaven had ordained, and then, almost as abruptly as she'd appeared, Joan of Arc was gone. Welcome to Strong Stories. If we've never met, I'm Charity Mainwaring, and in this channel, I share the stories of remarkable women who shaped history. If you like good stories, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell too, so you don't miss an episode. Before we get to Joan of Arc's tête-à-tête -tête with two dead saints and Michael the Archangel, you need to understand a little about what was going on in Joan's day. In a word, war specifically the Hundred Years' War, which was fought because the kings of England claimed also to be the kings of France. The French said, no, we don't recognize any claim that goes through the female line, and more importantly, we don't like you. We never have, we never will. But unfortunately for the French, things got a little complicated when their king, Charles VI, decided that he was made of glass and he began to wrap himself carefully in blankets so that he wouldn't break. With the French king sidelined by madness and the English looking for any opportunity to strike, France's only hope was for the French nobles to behave themselves for once and get along for the good of the nation. But apparently that was way too much to ask, so the king's brother and cousin started a civil war instead. Hostilities started out mildly enough, with both parties just exchanging rude insults. One side was saying, you're having an affair with the queen. And the other side answered, well, you kidnapped the royal children. Incidentally, both accusations were probably true. And then we had Mad King Charles just wanting everybody to be wrapped up in blankets and not run into him, lest he break into a thousand shards. But this war of words quickly led to violence, and the upshot was that the king's brother and his cousin were both assassinated. While the French had been distracted by civil war, the English had been busy bees. Henry V of England had charged once more into the breach, seizing control of northern France by 1418, and was apparently poised to take the rest when, in 1422, he got sick and died. A few months later, so did the mad king, Charles VI of France. So basically, all the major players were dying, and things were in chaos. So where did that leave things? France needed a king to be crowned at the traditional holy site, the cathedral at Reims. But the question was, who? Henry V's son, Henry VI, was a baby back in London, so he couldn't go. And the Mad King's son, Charles VII, couldn't go to Reims either because it was in the hands of the English. Meanwhile, the English kept advancing against the French, even without their leader, Henry V, and they were doing quite well. So well, in fact, that by 1429, only one city remained between them and vanquishing the rest of France. That city was Orleans, and the English had it surrounded. The French needed a miracle, and a miracle is just what many were expecting, as prophecies had circulated for years that one day, France would be on the brink of ruin and a virgin would be sent to the rescue. Well, well, well. Now, isn't that interesting? Joan of Arc was born around 1412 in Dom Rémy, France. At age 16, she experienced an astonishing visitation. Michael the Archangel, flanked by St. Catherine and St. Margaret, who had both been martyred as teens. They told her she must travel through the war zone to help the true king of France, Charles VII. Over the next year, the visions continued and her mission became twofold to break the siege of Orleans, the city surrounded by the English, and to see the true king crowned at Reims. Joan went to the nearest garrison commander, Sir Robert of Baudricourt. The 16-year-old told him she was sent by God and asked him to take her to the king some 300 miles away. 
Sir Robert countered with an offer to send her back to her father's house for a beating. Not one to give up easily, Joan returned to Sir Robert twice more, and on the third occasion she prophesied that the French had just suffered a grave defeat at Orleans, and that her mission was now all the more urgent. A few days later, the uncanny news arrived of a major defeat at Orleans. Impressed, Sir Robert granted Joan an escort of six men. To avoid attracting attention as they passed through enemy territory, Joan dressed as one of the soldiers. When the uncrowned French king, Charles VII, heard that a female visionary was coming to advise him, he thought to expose her as a fraud. Joan had never seen him before and had no idea what he looked like, so he hid among his courtiers, giving no sign of his true identity when she entered the room. With eerie confidence, Joan made a beeline directly for Charles, addressing him as king and stunning both him and his attendants. Joan had a private audience with the king, but he wouldn't commit to her plan until she faced panels of theologians and even had an examination to verify her virginity. Finally, everyone agreed she was a good Catholic and maybe sent by God? And once committed, Charles went all in, giving her a white horse, a banner of her own design, and specially tailored armor. She would certainly cut a figure in the eyes of the demoralized French people. But beyond the smiles of hopeful peasants and the barren fields of her war-tormented homeland, there rose the smoke of Orleans. Locked in the grip of a heretofore irresistible foe, how could a mere girl, scarcely more than a child, possibly hope to relieve the beleaguered city and reverse the agony of France? Upon her arrival at Orleans, Joan was greeted enthusiastically by the rank and file of French forces, but the noble leadership was dubious. They were willing to use her as a mascot to recruit volunteers, but the teenage peasant girl was left out of all of their war councils. On May 4th, an attack was planned without Joan's knowledge to break the English siege at a strategic fort. The French had already tried and failed to lift the siege, and this attempt was faring no better. Despite being a few miles away, Joan suddenly leapt to her feet, declaring that she was needed. When she rode onto the battlefield, her banner streaming behind her, the dejected French troops gave a deafening cheer and renewed the attack. They went on to win the day. Over the next several days, at Joan's urging, the French pressed the attack again and again. On May 6th, a commander declared his intention to take up a defensive position, but Joan would have none of it, crying out, in the name of God, let us go on bravely. Another fort fell. The next day, Joan was at the forefront of the attack, the first to place a ladder against the final fort in her way. However, by now the English were on the lookout for this strange girl, and she received a crossbow bolt in the neck for her efforts. The attack faltered as Joan was taken from the battlefield, writhing in agony. The suddenly hesitant soldiers had to wonder, was God not with her after all? Picture this, a teenage girl with a six-inch wound in the neck. Many a grim-faced soldier has broken down and bawled for his mother, and those of us who have never fought in battle are in no place to judge. But Joan? She was back in the saddle later that day, her banner high overhead to the exultant cheers of the men. The English looked on in horror. Who was this new foe who caused their enemies to fight like madmen? The men surged forward, seizing the final fort and driving the English into hasty retreat. On May 8th, four days after Joan arrived at the front lines, the siege of Orleans was broken. This stunning success opened up many possibilities for the victorious French. They could do all sorts of cautious things. They could retake Normandy. That would be nice and easy as the English were weak there or they could just secure their newfound territory against English counterattack. The king's commanders all advised caution. Only Joan argued for a seemingly reckless undertaking, the seizure of Rons deep in enemy territory. 
So great was Joan's prestige following Orleans that Charles gave in to her repeated urgings and allowed her to at least try to do the impossible. In a week of frenzied activity in which Joan was not just in the thick of action, but giving advice to military commanders who no longer dared to refuse her, town after town fell. The back-footed English finally drew their battle lines at Pate. What followed is called a battle by historians, but it might just as easily be dubbed a massacre. Joan, for her part, is said to have wept over the English dead, but the French fighting men were well pleased. True to form, Charles' military advisors urged him to halt. Ron still seemed out of reach. The teenage girl alone held fast to her vision. By force of personality, she got her way. The French army moved forward and more towns fell, village after village, overawed by the growing legend of the Maiden of Orleans, opened their gates without a fight. On July 16th, 1429, the army of France arrived at the walls of Reims, and the city threw open its gates in immediate submission. The following day, Charles VII was crowned King of France, while Joan of Arc looked on in a place of honor at his side, her heavenly vision fulfilled. What I would love to be able to tell you is that Joan returned home in triumph and lived happily ever after. But that didn't happen. What did happen is horribly tragic. After the coronation, Joan insisted the army must move against Paris at once, but Charles had finally started to listen to his other advisors. Joan had been useful to him, but now he wanted a negotiated peace. Not to be put off, Joan set off to Paris without him, leading whatever troops would follow her. What came next was a disaster. Her forces broke like water against the towering walls of the French capital, and Joan was rescued from the battlefield at night with a crossbow bolt to the leg. But she remained as fanatical as ever. Over the next few months, she rode here and there all across France, sometimes leading only a few hundred men, sometimes with no supplies. On May 23rd, 1430, Joan was captured by the Burgundians, allies of the English showing a ruthlessness that contrasts starkly with Joan's fierce loyalty. King Charles declined to ransom his number one fan, and the teen was instead sold for a stupendous sum to the English. This was a death sentence. The vengeful English tried her as a witch, a heretic, and a cross-dresser because of her armor. The outcome was never in doubt. On May 30th, 1431, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake. The English ordered the executioner not to mercy kill her before setting fire to her body. Joan was to feel the flames as she died. Her body was taken down and burned again and again. Finally, her ashes were thrown into the River Seine. 22 years after her death, the French officially won the Hundred Years' War. Three years later, the outcome of Joan's trial was reversed. In 1803, Napoleon dubbed her the symbol of France, and in 1920, Joan of Arc was named a saint. Due to her courage, her character, and the startling speed with which she saved France exactly when all seemed lost, Joan of Arc stands alone as the outstanding figure of the 15th century. Print that, Gutenberg. Her personality towers above every other actor in the Hundred Years' War, even including Henry V. Sorry, Henry, you tried. If France had fallen, as seems inevitable without her intervention, the world would not be recognizable today. Just as, for instance, without a united France, the American Revolution is likely to have failed. Without a strong United States, Germany is likely to have won the First World War. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and let me know in the comments what other powerful women from history you'd like us to cover. And be sure to check out my new video on Harriet Beecher Stowe, the woman who started the Civil War. Thanks again for watching. You can do hard things. Be brave, be strong.